Hello, very warm welcome to all uh, to this Stem Farm live event at the Widog. I'm Gwaud Hughes and I will be the presenter for this evening. So this event tonight will mainly be in Welsh, um, therefore there is an Engli English simultaneous translation option available. Um, if you could please uh, click on the Korean option on the interpretation icon on your screen. And if you click Korean, you should be able to hear the interpreter. Okay. So I'm glad that you've been able to join us here live this evening from Rhiwedog, although uh, it isn't quite the same as being at an on-farm event, we will do our utmost best to try to bring the farm to you live uh, and to describe the work that is ongoing here currently. I also encourage you to ask questions for us to be able to respond to what you uh, wish to know and to get the response of our panelists here this evening and the specialists we have on our panel. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your message and send it to us. So joining us this evening, there are a number of specialists who have been working with us on this project in Rhiwedog. Our contributors this evening include Chu Angels, uh, who's uh, a veterinarian from uh, Wern uh, Vet Surgery, the contact vet for the farm, and he's been working with us on the fertility project here. Secondly, Stephen Fagan uh, from Mukon, who's going to lead us through uh, a bit more information uh, and a descriptor of how the Mukol technology works. John Richards from Hadiki Kamri, who will be giving us uh, an update on the Stock Plus project that HCC are implementing. Chris Della, who's an independent grassland specialist who's been working closely with uh, the family here at Rewey Dog and Farming Connect on the grass project here. And Eric P. Roberts, who I'm certain is a familiar face for a number of you in this locality in Mirionith. Uh, he will take us through the range of services available from Farming Connect and the work that we have in hand. As of yet, Errol has not joined us, but we hope that he'll be with us later on. Uh, I think he's experiencing some technical difficulties. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to the stars of this evening, Emir Dalan and Ale Jones Dog. I'm exceptionally glad to be able to say that Dog is one of the livestock demonstration farms uh, for Farmer Connect here in North Wales. And we are privileged to work uh, with a family of farmers who are so well respected in the area uh, and indeed respected Crown Wales. We're exceptionally thankful for the opportunity to work with you. So in order to make a start on this evening's meeting then, I'd like to ask you uh, to give us a, a context, the background of the farm here at Rewey Dog, uh, who's farming here, uh, the family and so forth, and a bit more information about the stock, etc. Please, if you would. We farm in partnership here at Rewey Dog. It's a farm that amounts to about 350 acres, and we rent uh, a neighbouring holding as well that's also around 300 acres. We stock between the both, we stock uh, around 1,500 ewes and 70 settler cows. Can you tell us a bit more about the type of ewes that you keep, the breeds, uh, and uh, the system in terms of fattening or selling stores, and possibly a bit more information about the cattle side of the enterprise, the breeds that you run here, and your system in terms of the beef enterprise? Well, last year, I've been here. By now, Two thirds of uh, the ewes are, are crossbreds, Texel, Mules, Aberfields, and Cheviot cross Welsh sheep. And then a third of them are Welsh. That uh, lamb later on in April outside, but all the crossbreds uh, lamb indoors. And then do you fatten them here at Rui Dog? We do fatten them, uh, we fatten all the lambs if possible. I'd imagine that 80% of the lambs uh, are sold uh, live. We sell a lot of um, breeding ewes. There is a proportion that goes straight to the abattoir. Can you tell us a bit more about the beef enterprise here at Rui Dog and how that works for you? 
there are some seventy or so settler like cows here. Uh, the vast majority are Welsh black cows. Then half of them uh, are put to a Welsh black bull, and we cross the other half with a Charlie bull. The heifers then uh, are put to uh, a Soler bull and have been put to that Soler bull uh, for some three years for easier calving. And as we use a Welsh black bull and a Charlie bull, we seem to be getting the best of both worlds. We are able to rear own replacements and the Charlie bull then will uh, produce uh, very marketable stores uh, that put weight on uh, and gain weight from a very young age. We then sell those so cattle at around 18 months old and we we rear our own replacement heifers. Excellent. And Emir, this is very much a family enterprise. Can you tell us a bit more uh, about the family who is farming here at Chewirog? Well, uh, Lynn, myself and, uh, and the boys in partnership, as was mentioned. I feel that it's a partnership that works well. We get along very well and uh, especially over the past few months uh, one has had to um, do for ourselves to a greater extent um, over the past seven years we've been having students from Glenlivon to cover lambing period but this year due to the situation with the coronavirus uh, the students had to leave us at around after three days of being here and so uh, the four of us um, Plodded through and we managed it on our own. But having said that, uh, we, we did cope well, but it, 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 that, that's how the story went. And enough children and grandchildren to, to help you. Yes, hopefully they'll be there for the future. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. Excellent. So, what are your objectives then as a family in terms of the business? And what, uh, what are your main targets or, or main? Uh, it is a focus for the future for the next five to ten years. Well, I'd imagine we don't have any massive plans to do uh, anything that's really different. It's just for us to possibly look to make the best of what we have here on farm to try to get more from the ewes, more from the cattle, from the grass that we grow here so that we can possibly suppress our costs as much as possible in order for us to hopefully be a bit more profitable uh, and face that day when possibly there won't be any subsidy payments or support payments. Efficiency clearly is an important part and an integral part of the projects that we have been planning and implementing here with you. And this leads us nicely to talk a bit more about those projects and the work that's ongoing here at Rayway Dog. So we have two projects that are being implemented currently here. The first one looking at uh, settler herd fertility and the second element focusing on improving efficiency of the system by making better use of grass. For instance, Aled, how do you intend to um, better utilise your grass? What uh, is the main rationale behind wanting to do that? Is it to reduce your costs in terms of uh, lamb fattening, creeping lambs and so forth. Yes, in the past, possibly, we have been overly reliant on finishing uh, the lambs from the bag. Well, we'd like to possibly suppress as many of those costs as possible, and try to fatten the lambs off grass. Or possibly looking more down the line of uh, the herbalays, uh, etc. Uh, we've done that as part of this project. Uh, looking to fat more off the grass. And moving on from that then, please, uh, I ask you to bear in mind some of the farming health services that can be very useful for your business. An 80% offering of one-to-one -one advice that includes uh, a whole range of subjects, including grassland management, nutritional management, and please, I urge you to make the most of those opportunities and really avail yourselves of the opportunities that are there for you. So we'll move on to talk a bit more about, uh, a bit more detail about the fertility project that is currently being implemented here. So can you just give us a background to this cattle fertility project? 
why have you focused on fertility in the Sakla Herdia? Any specific reasons why you chose to uh, approach that issue? Well, we'd like to tighten up the calving period, to be honest. That's the main objective from going into it from the outset. Ideally, we'd like to have uh, a third of the herd uh, calving February to April and the rest then in May into June. Over the past few years, uh, a few have slipped on uh, and they calve towards the end of the summer months. The biggest reason for that was that we had a bull here that didn't function uh, as, uh, as planned a few years ago and that has meant that a number of the cows have slipped on and they uh, were calving later on uh, towards the end of summer, we'd like to bring those back uh, so that they calve in May and in June. So in terms of your fertility levels so far, is tightening that calving pattern the main objective or is there anything else as well that's a driving factor, increasing conception rates, uh, anything else that you'd like to achieve uh, via that project? Well, obviously, tightening up was uh, the biggest focus of it, tightening it up so that we wouldn't be calving late on into the summer. Our calving index this year to date uh, is around uh, 376 days. That's what it's been to date. But having said that, there are a few cows who still haven't calved. So by the time everyone heard will have calved, uh, it's going to be a bit more than that. They have ranged from 319 to uh, 450 days. And although the average of 376 uh, isn't right, it's, it's not the worst, we would have liked to have finished calving by the end of June, ideally, because we'd have uh, an even bunch of calves then. And I'd imagine that the management of those calves would be easier when you have an even bunch. Any specific reason why you feel that the period has extended more than what you more than that you wanted or what you'd like to see? Any fertility issues, bulls that you mentioned that have been in the past? Well, yes, I did say that we had a bull a few years ago that worked well for us for two years. On the third uh, year, he was turned to the cows as usual. And possibly we took for granted that the bull would work uh, as normal. That wasn't the case. And by the time we found that the bull wasn't uh, functioning, a number of the cows had slipped on in terms uh, of their calving. And that's the main reason as to why we lost some ground in, in that respect, we lost the calving pattern. But you see that things are coming back into order and we hope that via this project we'll be able to tighten things further for you if possible. Then what are your views to date of the MOOCOL heat technology that you've been using here at Rewaydog uh, for the fertility project? To date things seem to be working well. Uh, it looks to be very useful. We uh, have a ping and a text on the phone every time there's uh, a cow that's pulling. Uh, the app on the phone will keep records of every cow that has shown signs of bullying, uh, everyone that hasn't uh, shown signs of heat, and every three weeks we can have a list of uh, which cows have repeated, uh, and you hope if they haven't repeated that they would have conceived. So, uh, it's exceptionally useful for us to know where we stand, and we hope uh, to scan uh, in the next week or so uh, and that'll give us uh, a firmer picture of uh, what, what of the scan results actually matching up with what we've seen on our technology. So what will you do then with those cows who won't have conceived to date? What's the next steps for those? Well, we can then bring in the veterinarian to investigate the rationale. If there are individual cows that haven't been on heat, we can possibly get the vet to synchronize them or to investigate what the issue is. For instance, this year we had a, a new bull. And when that bull was turned to the cows, we were not guaranteed uh, that it, it, would, um, it would work. 
but via this technology we can see that the cows were showing heat in three weeks time we could see that they weren't repeating uh, so we were quite certain in our minds then that the bull was working as planned so Aled, what would success from this project look like for you what what would you foresee would be the main advantages, if you will, uh, that will come from the findings and the results of this project for your system here at Rewedog? Well, I'd imagine that the best result we could have would be uh, a tightening up of that calving period. The Mukol heat, it does give one peace of mind, if you will, in the past. Uh, you turn the bull out in May and you just hope for the best really and we don't really know what happens out in the field we don't see them often enough uh, you see them once twice a day very often we don't see uh, the cows showing heat uh, and with this you've got the information in your pocket you get a text when there's a cow bulling and uh, if she repeats, well, then it gives you the peace of mind that you're in control. Uh, it can give you peace of mind that the bull is working or can highlight any issues. Certainly, I'd imagine that it's of benefit to Joe, the veterinarian who works with you on this project, to be able to run some specific investigations for those few cows who possibly would have repeated. Uh, and it's better use of the veterinarian's time when he does visit the farm. So, Dylan, what have the biggest challenges been to date considering this project and when you look at Mukol heat specifically we did have some difficulty at the start with the tags that uh, after uh, investigating uh, our tagging equipment uh, was at fault we struggled to tag some of the cows at the start uh, obviously uh, there's uh, more setup work in year one uh, because you need to tag all the cows afterwards it's only the heifers that you need to tag from afresh emir how did you see the setting up work for this technology to be honest, I see it to be uh, an excellent piece of technology. I wasn't aware of it at all until this year, and uh, I'm very much certain that it will help us. And I'm hoping that it will help others uh, if we trial it here. Hopefully other farmers will get to see well uh, whether the technology will suit them or not. Well, that's the hope, to be honest, that we are able to uh, disseminate the information and the findings from uh, the project here at Rubidog with other farmers in order for them to be able to consider if it would be an option for them to improve their f efficiency. So thank you very much for your feedback on that. Unfortunately, Joe, the veterinarian, cannot join us, but he has sent us a video recorded beforehand that will give us a bit more background to the project. And he's touched on the progress uh, or, or any findings that we've had to date and at the same time please remember if you have any questions as we proceed either to the panel or to uh, the specialists you're more than welcome to send those questions into us also if you have any specific questions for joe please do send the question in and we'll pass them on uh, to joe and we'll email a response to you for those specific questions so if we can play joe's video then please on the fertility project here at Rewey dog hello my name is joe angel in english working for Wernvet in north wales and i've been asked to help out with the bee fertility project running at Rewey dog farm this project was set up for two reasons firstly over time the calving pattern at Rewey dog had become considerably extended, such that cows were calving over too long a period of time. This has created problems with managing calves and rearing animals to sell. Also, Dolan and Aled were interested in using the Mukol heat detection collar as an aid to improving the management of fertility within the herd. In these series of graphs, you can see how long the calving period is. So what I've done here is just graph the uh, numbers of cows calving over time. So we've got time along the bottom. And you can see that here in 2016, calving starts in January and goes through to uh, September, with a majority of the cows calving sometime in May. It's quite a long period of uh, nearly nine months um, 
carving. Then uh, in 2017, we've got a similar pattern with a few more carving in April. And then again, the majority carving in uh, late spring, uh, early summer around June. But again, the carving period going from January now through to October. Then again in 2018, we've got quite a few carving early on, but then again the majority in late spring, early summer, but again the carving interval, uh, period going through till the end of September. And then finally in 2019, um, again a long carving period, um, but with quite a few carving early on and then the majority carving uh, more into the summer at this point. Cows can comfortably bring a calf every year, but if this interval between calvings is longer than a year, then the cow becomes a cost in terms of keeping her without the return from her offspring. In addition, if cows are allowed to take longer between calvings, then it can be harder to get them in calf and it can increase the difficulties associated with calving. For example, cows taking a long time to get pregnant can easily become too fat by the time they calve, increasing the risk of calving difficulties with knock-on effects to the health of the cow and the calf. So there are financial and health and welfare benefits to ensuring cows become pregnant within an optimal period. This period may vary between farms. However, at Ruedog, we wanted to calve cows roughly in two groups in late spring. The two groups allow for easier downstream management of the calves and the timing is to take advantage of expected grass growth and the opportunity to make use of outside space. So with the combined aim of reducing the calving interval for some cows and in shortening the calving period, we devised the following plan. The Mookal heat collar was fitted to two bulls in order to identify early which cows were served. Then we plan to scan these cows at about 30 days post service to determine if they were pregnant. This meant that cows that were not pregnant could be investigated for problems that might have affected their ability to conceive. We also plan to scan cows that had been with the bull for three to four weeks and had not been served. Examination of the ovaries from these cows meant we could see if there were any problems here that might affect conception. For those cows that were scanned and observed to not be cycling, or only very weakly, we then used a hormone synchronization program to kickstart the ovulation process. This means that these cows are not allowed to carry on with dormant ovaries indefinitely, and these actions, we hope, will ensure these cows get in calf sooner than they would otherwise, and so reduce any further extension of their calving interval. In addition, we hope to gradually bring cows forward. So by getting them in calf earlier, using the synchronization process, then they should carve earlier the following year, thereby contracting the calving period. In addition to focusing on the fertility of the cows, improving heat detection and investigating and dealing with problem cows, it was also important to consider the fertility of the bulls. To that end, we arranged for fertility testing of the bulls with one of my colleagues, Emma Sale, to determine whether the bulls were likely to be able to get cows in calf. So, what have we achieved so far? Well, things have been slightly more awkward due to a certain ongoing pandemic. However, the Mukol heat collars have been deployed and they appear to be working very well. Cows are being identified by the collar and when we scan them, they are in calf. Some cows have had dormant or non-cycling ovaries and so we have synchronized these as described and they have been subsequently served. We are still some way from evaluating how much progress has been made this year but the plan is certainly being actioned. It has been challenging being able to scan the cows as frequently as we would have liked in that not all the grazing that is used has easy access to suitable handling facilities. This may mean that cows that need interventions are delayed in having them, which may impact on our ability to achieve the aims. But this is a practical problem encountered on many farms and not one that is unique to Ruedog. Moving forward, we will continue this process throughout the summer 
and then try and evaluate how well it has worked this year before deciding if we want to make any changes in the future. Thank you very much, Joe, for preparing that video for us. Just a few questions that have been sent in today. There was asked, what your BVD status is currently at Redog? We've been a part of the SAC health scheme for over 20 years. We have accredited BVD since 2004 and we've been participating in the Gwaredi BVD scheme that the government have been running for a few years by now. I'd like to remind farmers as well that the Gwaredi BVD scheme has been extended up until uh, March 31st, 2021. So certainly it's something else for you to avail yourselves of in order for you to improve herd health. Just a few other questions that have been submitted. Someone has asked, what are the costs associated with using the new call system? We will come on to that uh, later on when we have uh, Stephen Fagan from uh, Moo Call addressing us also. Ali Jones has asked, if to date, have you found that the technology works better or are you getting a better response when you run a younger bull as opposed to an older bull? Uh, Alad suggests possibly that a younger bull uh, will um, clear the cat more than an older bull would. Uh, do you see a difference in terms of uh, the findings running different bulls? No, I wouldn't say that there's uh, any difference in that respect, to be honest, to date uh, anyway. What we did see when we turned the bull to the heifers, uh, the heifers tended to, we, we had a text on the phone within the first two, three days uh, of turning the bull to the heifers, uh, according to the Mukol, uh, they were all on heat there, there or then. Uh, well, obviously they'd seen a new bull and were quite uh, excited by that, obviously. But we, we'll see when we scan what, uh, what the findings will be. Possibly that is a question uh, that, that's for the next section for Stephen, uh, possibly he might be aware of any other examples, uh, whether uh, those types of things happen or not. Also another question uh, for you guys, are the heifers managed differently to the rest of the cattle? Do you calve them down earlier? Do you use different bulls for easier calving? I know that you mentioned that you use a solaire bull uh, to achieve easier calving for the heifers. In terms of management then, and in terms of managing those heifers, uh, do they calve down differently from the rest of the cows? Well, we've started to uh, turn the bull to the heifers sooner in order for them to calve sooner uh, so that they possibly have more time. So if they do don't calve until June, if they're heifers, well then it's very difficult uh, for them uh, to get them uh, back into calf, for them to calve in April and May. That's the one thing that we have tried to do differently. So we've been discussing this Moo Call Heat technology that we've been using here. So we'll move on to our second speaker, Stephen Fagan from Moo Call who uh, is joining us live from Ireland this evening. And Stephen's going to talk a bit more about the way the technology works and so forth. And hopefully he'll give a bit more background information uh, about some costs and some technicalities. For instance, we've had a question uh, asking about uh, the battery life of the callers. Uh, hopefully Stephen will be able to answer those questions during his presentation. Welcome Stephen. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the Mucol Heat um, technology and how it works as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks very much for, for obviously having, having us on. Um, unfortunately, I don't speak any Welsh, so I hope you can all understand my Irish accent OK. Um, when Mucol were asked to be part of this project, obviously, we were delighted to be able to demonstrate really how the system works and also how it can obviously bring huge benefits to the to the likes of whether you're using a stock bull, for example, or you're using AI for your breeding season. Uh, just to make the farmer's time more efficient, obviously, you're not checking on cows on a regular basis or checking that the bull is functioning correctly. So um, 
that's obviously where we put our huge focus on in, in the farmer's time and making, making it more efficient, especially from a, a breeding management point of view. Um, so just to give you a slight bit of a background really on ourselves, um, I suppose we're obviously based here in Dublin in Ireland. Um, we have a team of about 15 to 20 people. Um, currently, we, we've been working remotely for the last number of months, understandably, but um, I suppose we have two products that we, we have uh, for the last number of years. So we started out obviously with the Mucol Cavan sensor, which a lot of you may be familiar with. Um, and then in 2017, we released our to our heat detection system. So um, just to start really, and, and just to give you a brief, everyone that's watching, a brief understanding as to how the system works, um, I'm just going to uh, show you a, a short video um, just to, to demonstrate this. Now, so I hope you all enjoyed that, just a quick video. So as you can see, really, um, the system itself, I suppose we're utilizing the bull and we're working on the back of nature really to, to operate and, and to indicate when, when heats are present for the farmer and obviously to know uh, exactly when cows have been served and when uh, to make sure that your bull is working correctly. So our algorithm itself is based on three core elements and it's a measure of these elements and we're obviously able to pick depict exactly when the bull has been serving the cow or been with the cow. Um, so we're working off your activity. So the amount of activity that includes your mountain periods and movement around each specific cow that's in the field, uh, the time threshold. So the amount of time that the bull spends with a specific cow uh, in comparison to other cows that may be in the field as well, uh, as you can see from the, both video and from the, the guy's farm. Um, and also the proximity, so the distance between that specific tag in the fields compared to all the other tags that the bull is actually dealing with. So what's it telling the farmer? Well, it's telling you the, the exact standing time of heat. So whether you're using AI, for example, artificial insemination, it'll be able to indicate to you exactly when you should be serving the cow. And also from a stock bull point of view as to when cows are actually being served by the bull in the fields or in the shed. Um, you're being alerted to all heats. So whether they're normal heats um, or you may have shorter or silent heats and also for any cows which may have issues that, that could be cystic. Um, It'll also help you to identify any cows which are not cycling correctly. And this is one of the biggest issues for the major a good few of uh, your breeding season to, tr to try identify these cows early uh, in order to get your vet to, to check them out. Um, also, if you have any fertility issues which are bull, obviously th this would be very apparent, uh, especially earlier on in the season where you could have, you know, in the first three weeks and, you, you know, you're assuming that all your cows are after being served, but they're, they're all coming back in heat again and our system is is picking them up. So um, identifying cows that are, are in calf and also ones that are empty uh, is our, our, main, our main goal here. So, um, and obviously all the information that the collar picks up on, it's all translated into the, the Moo Call breed management app, uh, which is a free app for your smartphone. 
So the tags that you're obviously putting into the ear, they're a specific Moo call tag and they work off, uh, they have a, a chip inside the tag and it's only being read by the Moo call uh, collars themselves. Um, and this tag is just assigned, as you've seen in the video, to the cow either name or number. Uh, and that's how we identify what cows are in heat and when they're in heat. So obviously the importance of heat detection, I mean, as the guys had said, you know, if you do have a bull which isn't fertile or even subfertile, it can cause uh, a lot of issues. So being able to observe your bull on a, on a daily basis and to obviously pick up on what he's doing is, is so important. And obviously in the long run, it's going to, to benefit your herd from a breeding point of view. If you're trying to either compact your calf in season or, or try to identify cows which aren't uh, in, in calf at all, this will be able to eliminate uh, the need for having to, I suppose, go out and, and check cows on a regular basis and make sure that everything is, is in calf at the end of the season. So um, I suppose failure to detect any heats and, and errors in heat detection are two of the primary causes of poor reproductive performance and, and low reproductive efficiency. One of the most interesting things as well, I suppose, to observe is at night time as well, what we were able to find is you know, especially when you're not there to obviously observe the cows, is where 60 to 75 percent of your heats actually are, are taking place at night time, where activity amongst the herd is a lot lower. So that allows when uh, uh, you know estrus is, is is in place, that the farmer or that the bull will be able to pick up on uh, heats a lot easier and and pick up on the start of heat durations as well. So from a bull performance point of view, I mean, 4% of all bulls are infertile and up to 20% of bulls are subfertile. Now, subfertile bulls can cause a bit of a headache, especially, you know, if you, you have some cows in calf and some cows aren't in calf, you know, that's why it's so important to have bulls fertility tested well in advance of the season taking place, just to eliminate those issues for you going forward. So a good heat detection system can indicate, you know, both of these scenarios to you and, and early on. So I suppose the advantages from both a stock bull point of view and a, a vasectomized teaser bull point of view for AI use, um, for your stock bull, I mean, Ideally, it does eliminate your need for actually scanning at the end of the season because we're accurately able to tell you exactly what cows are, have been served, when they were in heat, how many cycles of heat that they've had, and if they have uh, held insemination. Um, ultimately, we're able to provide you with your calf and due dates at the end of the season, um, and obviously the time that you're, you're saving in comparison to daily observation uh, throughout your, your day. Um, also for vasectomized bulls that you're using for AI use, timing of AI is obviously extremely critical. So you don't want to be putting in AI straws um, at the incorrect time where the egg isn't fertile yet because you're, you're also just wasting your own time and you're obviously uh, maybe causing harm to the cow and, and you're wasting money at the end of the day. So obviously to improve your genetics, timing of AI is obviously critical so you're not wasting any straws. Um, and obviously it's, it's a very cost effective uh, solution. So on accuracy, I suppose we're, we're kind of gone through a, a good few of our breeding seasons now at the moment. The last number of months, especially for, for spring calving herds, uh, would be finished breeding uh, around this time. Um, so I suppose from last year's study, we were able to achieve, um, you know, if you're trying to obtain a, a tight, compact calving season, we were able to obtain a 96.5% a three-week submission rate, um, you know, which is quite substantial, uh, trying to compact your calving season as much as possible and from that three week, we were able to achieve almost an 80% uh, three week conception rate. So of all the heats that were, that were picked up at the start of season, we were able to um, indicate that those cows were in calf and held, uh, held insemination to the first serve. So as, as demonstrated um, just in our MooCall app that we have, so it's a free app that you're able to download and I suppose it's a breed management tool. So all the information that the bull is li liaising with the farmer um, is updated into the app accordingly. So, you know, everything is automated from the point of when a heat is detected to when an insemination occurs uh, and also to when cows are deemed in calf by the system. So, it, you know, it's very easy data to follow and you'll, you'll have everything at the, at the touch of your fingers being able to identify identify exactly what's going on throughout your herd at any point um, and be able to actually pick out cows that you may want to inspect or to, to have visually uh, inspected by the, by the, by the vet. 
Also, our, our other product there as well is our, our MooCall Calvin sensor, which, which I said a lot of you may be aware of. So this, again, it's, it's a similar type product that we're also using GSM networks uh, to connect to your, your mobile phone network uh, to, to send out your text messages to the farmer when the event occurs. So this device just literally attaches to the back of the cow's tail and it sends a text message to the farmer's phone exactly when the cow is, is coming into calf. So um, I suppose we're working on a spine of contraction in the tail that actually it's picking up on that tail movement and once the algorithm is met we trigger out that text message uh, just to make sure that you're not missing any calvins um, for, for, because you're not you're not being there basically. So with, with our solution on the Calvin sensor so far to date, we, we've actually detected over half a million uh, births since 2014 with the MooCall Calvin sensor. Um, and also we've been trying to, I suppose, reduce, our overall goal is to reduce mortality rates on farms. And we've managed to do that down to 0.5% you know, of people who actually use our product. And this is due to timely intervention. So being there on time when the cow is actually given birth and picking up on that, that Calvin. So ultimately that gives you the opportunity to improve your, your classroom management and, and give the calf the best start to life as well. So that's that's really it. I know that there was a couple of questions there in just regarding the the cost of the system. So uh, the system itself, the collar is it's at one thousand and ninety five uh, pounds sterling, uh, and that gives you um, one collar, and you actually get fifty ear tags with that system. So it does depend on the size of your herd. Um, typically, like in in the guy's case where they have uh, seventy cows, we would normally say like one collar would do up to fifty cows, and that's why we kind of have that recommended. Uh, ratio. Um, so if you do have above that, you would need an additional collar. Um, so like one bull to every 50 cows or two bulls uh, to every 100 cows. So um, each year there, there is a renewal similarly to the Calvin sensor. Um, and this is to keep the, mo the mobile phone network connected to the device throughout the full year. So whether you're breeding all year round or you're breeding for a select uh, few months in the year, uh, there's a renewal then of £255 uh, per year to keep that device connected up to your mobile phone network. Um, for any heifers that you're also bringing in each year, uh, obviously you will need the additional tags to put those in. You can purchase uh, further tags, which do come uh, typically in boxes of 25 tags for, for £75 sterling uh, for that as well. Um, also, just to address the, the other question there, just in about uh, bulls as well, um, I suppose there is a difference that we have found between younger bulls and, and older bulls. Um, not so much in insofar as picking up on, on heat detection, but it's more so in the activity that they would relay over the course of a day. So the amount of ground that a bull would cover, we find that younger bulls actually would spend longer with cows that are in heat um, compared to you know older bulls, which typically can become slightly lazy um, you know, as, as they actually get older as well. But performance-wise with the collar, the collar will adjust to, it, it's an actually adjustable, um, it's an algorithm that, that adjusts to the environment it's under. So we're able to determine, depending on the amount of cows that are in the field and the bull performance, you know, what, what works best for, for your system. Um, so that's, that's kind of just to give you an overview on that. We would see it, and especially if you're bringing in a vasectomized bull, typically around 18 months of age or 16 months of age for picking up on AI use. Normally they are younger bulls and we do see you know higher higher rates of activity with those. So um, yeah I just I hope that clarifies them couple of questions there for you. Great thank you Stephen. I'm sure that was very useful for, for all of us um, just to have a better idea really on how the technology works. Um, so we do have some additional questions which have just come in now uh, Stephen if we can have Stephen up on the screen please. Um, while we, we are asking. Um, so one of the questions, how long does the collar, the bull collar battery last normally? Yeah, um, so the battery will last typically around six to eight weeks. Um, it does depend on, I suppose, the amount of cows that the bull is actually dealing with in the field. Um, but it is a rechargeable battery. So typically your, your low battery message, um, when, the, when the device hits six, uh, 15%, um, and this allows you obviously to take the collar off the bull and it typically takes around six hours for it from, from flat uh, to, to 100%. Uh, and then you can put it back on the bull again um, for another six to eight weeks. So um, normally the case, like I suppose with around 40 to 50 cows, we would see you reaching more so to the, to the 80 or uh, eight week mark. 
That's great. Thank you, Stephen. And a few more questions also coming in for you. Um, are the tags reusable? Can they be used on another cow if the original cow has, has left the farm, for example? Um, uh, yeah, is that possible at all? Or would you need to purchase more tags um, for, 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 for different cows? Um, I suppose for the for the additional tags you would need to put in um, because we actually assign that cow um, to that specific you see there's a little chip inside each of the tags so once we assign that that RFID chip to the to the cow number the cow ID that actually stays with that cow for the duration that she is on your farm so you know typically for any new cows or new heifers that you're bringing into the herd, we'd always advise to put a new tag into that, that cow's ear as well. Um, I suppose over years as well, you know, of using the tags, we, we'd always just advise to put in fresh tags um, every time you have a new uh, cow or heifer that's on the farm. It's, it's just from a, from a maintenance point of view with the tag as well. Um, I suppose you could have a cow on your farm for 10 plus years, um, but I mean, like realistically, the tags would want to be, would want to be bulletproof in order to last forever. Forever, um, you know, so that's why we would say any new cows that you have, they'd, they'd last the duration that the cow was on your farm. Excellent, thank you, Stephen. And um, as I, I said, could I also encourage um, people to to carry on and sending in questions as well, if possible, please. Um, this is your opportunity to ask the experts tonight. Um, one final question at the moment for you, Stephen, unless any others pop up. Um, how many users can use the app for the, for the same farm? So, for example, here at Three Weight Dog, we have Alet um, and Dylan. And I don't know how um, it is with, with new technology, but um, is there a potential for, for uh, different users um, to, to access the app? Um, yeah, absolutely. There, there actually can be really per account, there can be a limited users on the app. So, you know, if there's, you know, five family members that want to be on it or even a neighbor or anything like that, or even if your vet wants to be um, on the app as well and just view your farm, um, they can all be logged in simultaneously and add information. Um, so there's no restrictions in place at all there. Great. Thank you, Stephen. I'm fully aware that we are using that um that approach at Rewit Dog with Aled and Dylan with uh, the apps on their phone um, with Joe the vet also having access to that to keep an eye um, out as well. Um, so, so uh, some of them line, Ian question are I so mm -hmm. ahead then, the one other question that has been submitted by Paul from Kai Hyde is asked what's the synchronization system that you use and how's it going for you? We spoke previously that Joe uh, does uh, investigate any cows who don't uh, appear to come into eat and then that we synchronize them to try to get them bullying uh, so that it, it doesn't uh, extend the calving pattern any longer. So what is the synchronization system that you use here uh, when, when Joe comes? We use dreads. When he came the last time to look at some cows, there were four who hadn't been showing signs of heat. Uh, so we put some threads in those. As of yet, we haven't scanned them for us to know uh, for certain, but one of them uh, I've observed visually uh, through the app uh, has repeated. We did synchronize eight, I think, towards the end of last summer to try to gain some ground to gain a mouth from them. Uh, we used AI at that time, uh, but three uh, from the eight conceived. If we could go back to Stephen, if possible, please. Um, Linda Davis is asking, how does does the Mookal Heat technology work with artificial insemination? Yeah, so I suppose you'd need, um, for artificial insemination, you do need to have a vasectomized bull. So because we are utilizing the bull and we're solely using the bull that's actually in the field, you will need uh, a bull present. And that's obviously to stimulate that the heats are, are there. So uh, with a vasectomized bull, we typically um, would, would, would I suppose get farmers to to vasectomize them any, anywhere from 10 plus months and and use bulls uh, you know typically you'd want to give around six to eight weeks uh, before putting them out with in the fields before they've had the operation so 
um, you'd be using your vasectomized bull. The vasectomized bull still holds the essential hormones for heat detection, like testosterone. So you're basically have have the the collar in, on that bull, uh, put him out in the field, and we're able to indicate uh, from his behaviour and his movement around the tags um, exactly when cows are coming into heat. And once you get your text message, you know cow one two three is in heat. You're able to separate that cow from the herd. Um, call your artificial insemination technician. Uh, to the farm or even if you you do AI yourself um, and then obviously serve that cow um, so it's your timing uh, of of actually serving the cow your timely intervention that makes it makes it critical for AI um, you're you're waiting 12 to 16 hours um, for best time to serve that cow so it gives you a long time threshold um, you know prior to actually serving her as well so it's an early indication Great, thank you, Stephen. I hope that answers your question, Linda. Um, but she'll submit them one. So as we move on, then we will talk a bit more about the importance of uh, monitoring fertility and the impact that it can have on the profitability of the beef enterprise. Habiki Kamri have been working on the Stock Plus project that enables farmers to take one to one advice from veterinarians in order to. Uh, assess flock and herd health on their farms. Aled Talan and Emir here at Redog, what value has been part of that Stock Plus project or to the enterprises in Redog to date? The fact that we have this one-to-one -one advice, uh, that's worth a great deal for us. It's uh, very easy to just pick up the phone to Joe, the veterinarian, or whoever else, ask the questions that are applicable. It's also been helpful in monitoring any health issues that the cattle have. Those who do uh, show heat the second and third time, we can ask Joe for the best advice as to what to do next. It's great to have uh, this advice that is so handy. I can imagine that it's so handy for you as farmers. And also, obviously, you have already mentioned that being part of that project and having that visit and the one-to-one -one advice has enabled you to focus on specific areas of the herd where possibly you would like to see an improvement and I'd imagine that you find the project useful in order to decide which areas those are and for instance you have uh, spoken previously that fertility was one of the main issues that you picked up on uh, that you could possibly um, improve uh, by engaging with the Stock Plus project and through working with Joe. So I'm glad to be able to report that has evidently been of benefit to you. So this evening we've got John Richards from Habiki Cymru joining us in order to talk a bit more about the Stock Plus project and any results or findings from that project to date uh, and really what the key messages are that they have found in delivering the project to date. So good evening John. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you this evening. I've got about 10 minutes in order to uh, present the work that we've done for the Stock Plus project. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, I have had some uh, IT difficulty, but I hope that the feed is clear for you. As you mentioned, the main theme of the Stock Plus project uh, in, that came from the Red Meat Development Programme that we run at HSC is to try to get uh, a bit more discussion and collaboration between the veterinarians and the farmers that we have enlisted, uh, especially when it comes to red meat production. And it's very interesting to hear about the projects that, uh, such as the one going on in Rueda. When we look at the findings from those uh, projects to date, uh, and we have over 150 uh, beef farms, farm wheels being a part of it, and 50% have said that one of the greatest challenges that they wanted to tackle within their herd was fertility. And that in itself demonstrates the importance of the issue, because obviously, if we want to look at how to make a bit more money in a system uh, that can be difficult at the best of times, the greatest thing about that is that you need to have a calf every year. And with 50, over 50% saying that that is the biggest issue, obviously, fertility can mean uh, a plethora of different things. If we look at the figures 
from the uh, vast majority of this 50%. What they want to look at uh, is the uh, length of uh, the calving pattern. Now, can we bring the bullying period down in order to have a, a tighter calving pattern? And the other issue that is often looked at is which uh, calves, which heifers uh, should be retained and run on uh, to become part of the herd. Uh, the, the pelvic scoring is an important issue. It's an issue that we often touch on. And what's great to hear and to see is that more and more vets in Wales are able to undertake this work. Now, obviously, that is imperative, it's key, because we uh, make this choice in terms of which heifers we retain and keep on and uh, we tend to uh, go off size or the breeding history or, or if the heifer isn't right to keep well then obviously uh, it's only going to be a problematic animal and we've got challenging anim animals where possibly we don't want to get rid of the heifer in the first year uh, and that's when you can uh, lead to prolonged calving periods so it is something that we touch on more and more often and the reason is time another reason is cost we know that when we look at uh, the cost of production work the cop work the margins in the beef system can be exceptionally tight at times and you can only have the one chance to have money out of every cow and every day that cow is not carrying calf is costing you at an average uh, for the suckler herd, we are looking at uh, 420 days. So that means that there are 60 days for every cow that we have in the herd, uh, an opportunity to reduce the calving interval. Now, obviously, it's a challenge uh, to bring that calving interval down to three, six, five days, which would be the utopian figure, obviously. But the real challenge is, can we bring it down to 400? If we can bring it down to there, uh, the herd will be in a better place. If we look at health issues uh, and what are the other challenges and drivers in terms of infectious diseases, obviously, that can mean a vast array of uh, different illnesses, ailments, diseases that fall into that. And then we tackle uh, issues such as flu control, worm control, how we do that and how we achieve biosecurity. Those are the issues that we predominantly focus on and they are the issues that appear time and time again from the projects that we run and the findings that come out. And the one thing that we do look at in this programme is fine to get all this baseline information to start on, but that relationship with a veterinarian uh, needs to continue for you to have the conversation in a year's time and thereafter um, you've looked at the challenges that we face as an industry or a challenge at farm level what has been done have the actions been delivered and if so what uh, results have been achieved what ad advantages have been gained uh, and what have we seen uh, have there been improvements if not did we have the uh, right problem in mind to start with and the continual challenge that we face in the industry is that there is no clear, simple, silver bullet solution. The jigsaw is a complex one and every piece has to be right in order for you to get the system to work efficiently. And what's great about this project, uh, similarly uh, to what's being delivered via Farm and Connect, it's a three year project. And that means essentially that you've got three years worth of engagement with the veterinarian. And especially in the beef system, it can be a lengthy period of time uh, between implementing any changes to the system and having any advantage from that change. So in the first year, as I said, uh, we've had some year one results. What's great is that over 90% of the farmers whom we have uh, asked uh, as project participants, uh, they have experienced an advantage. The greatest thing that they see as an advantage is that engagement with the veterinarian. Usually we approach the vet when there's a problem now we see these farmers approaching the vet. Uh, the important part of the project is that we work off data. So we uh, gather the data before the veterinarian visits the farm and we say, look, this is the farm's performance. You can then positively engage with the veterinarian to see where you compare with one of the farms in the area uh, and secondly with the wider industry in order for us to see uh, what derives results possibly the farmer uh, would start to see well actually i do have an issue with abc the important thing is to find out and to pin pinpoint where the problem started 
So that's what we see uh, as some of the advantages of projects that facilitates working with a veterinarian. In terms of time, uh, certainly uh, I, I don't have too much time. I had a 10 minutes, so to speak, but I, I have uh, put a few slides together to show uh, uh, the market updates. That's always something that we think about. So if you can have the slides uh, on screen, as we can see where it stands currently, this is the slide uh, showing the lamb prices. It's fragmented, I'm sorry. We have seen prices at a level that we haven't seen at this time of year previously. There are various reasons for that. Uh, we look at the level of inputs coming into the country. Uh, we've seen that's narrowed. And also uh, this festival that has just been, obviously that's helped to firm up the prices. And we've seen that uh, most recently, uh, that festival ran to the end of last week. We've seen that in the first few days of this week, uh, the price uh, has dropped somewhat, but to compare with this time last year and previous years, uh, we can see that the prices have remained buoyant. If we move on a slide, we can see in terms of beef, this is where we stand. Uh, there was a lot of concern in the market uh, back in March when COVID kicked in, and we can see why when you look at that uh, blue line where prices were. And what happened thereafter, obviously, uh, was we had a price down at the level, but the reason for that uh, was the amount of uh, meat being purchased as mincemeat. And that happened for a, a few weeks as COVID kicked in. But we've seen since April uh, that the price has improved somewhat uh, and it's improved week on week. And as it stands currently, uh, we're looking at 2018 as a good year in terms of prices. Uh, the price has increased on that front and we can see currently uh, that the demand uh, is uh, surpassing the availability of product on the market. So uh, I would see uh, that, that the graph is in the right shape, uh, but it, it is uh, a situation uh, that, that's quite strong for the industry as it stands currently. Just in terms of market information, just to give a plug to this information that we have on the website, we've got a lot of statistics in these booklets and the bulletins if anyone is interested. And also for those who've tuned in this evening uh, who may be interested in the marketing work that we've done, on the 1st of August every year, we have this uh, as Lamb Day and we can see some of the promotional and marketing work that we did over this period of time and we can clearly see uh, from the images that you see uh, it has been delivered via social media and all of this although the price of lamb is buoyant as it stands currently we are approaching a time of year when there will be more lamb hit in the market and as a result of that we run uh, our campaign from the 1st of August uh, and you can see some of the information that we've disseminated on slides, uh, some recipes, some slides and so forth. Uh, and we find that it does have an impact. What we also try to do is we provide quicker recipes for people to cook in order to um, keep demand as high as possible. Uh, and that comes at the time of year when uh, the number of animals onto the market increases. And uh, I figured to close that I'd give you a bit more information about what we've been doing uh, as HEC over this uh, recent period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. I am aware that we are somewhat behind on time, but there are two questions that have been submitted, if you could respond, John. The first one, can you link FOWL with STOCK PLUS? Can the two issues be merged? Yes, and the whole purpose of it is not to produce new herd health plans. That's not the whole point of it. It's more to do with looking at farm performance and as a part of that work, the veterinarian will look at the health plan that the farm has in place uh, and that will directly tell us, is it a right fit for the farm? Because the challenge is, but all these documents, they are static. Situations change from year to year, situations are fluid, and it's important for you to be able to change uh, the health plan uh, to conform with the year and the performance of the farm. So it is an important part in order to look at uh, what the health plan on farm is. 
uh, and to see if that is a best fit and does it follow with the findings of new technology uh, and the data sets that we have uh, the research uh, and the data that's continually evolving in terms of animal health uh, that uh, is then uh, showcased and demonstrated on farms pan wheels thank you john and the last question how can you become a part of the stock plus project are there any specific criteria or what's the procedure uh, if you would be enthusiastic to be a part of this project as it stands currently we have 250 farmers engaged with the project and uh, as a result, we'd want 400 farmers. So we are looking for all farmers to be a part of it. Now, obviously, usually we would have opened an application window for people to uh, apply to be a part of the project, but because of the COVID situation, we haven't been able to proceed uh, to go out onto farms. So we have postponed uh, that application window to bring farmers into the project uh, until the autumn. So hopefully when the autumn comes and hopefully the COVID situation will have improved somewhat by then, uh, you'll see that we will be disseminating information to the industry as to how to be a part of this project uh, for the forthcoming two years. Excellent, thank you very much, John. Thank you for uh, your presentation and thank you for the answers that you gave. I'm certain that there's much more information about Stock Plus available and the rest of HEC's work, it's available on the website should you wish to access it. In moving forward then, I'd also like to remind you of the one-to-one -one animal health clinics that are offered via Farming Connect currently. These are looking at a wide range of health issues. It can include blood testing, um, scab testing, uh, ram and bull fertility, fecal egg counting, and also post-mortems uh, for stock as well. And as I mentioned previously, there is an extension uh, of the Goredi BVD project that will run until the end of March next year. So moving on uh, with the issues this evening, I'd like to talk a bit more about the grassland projects that we've been working on here at Trewedog. Aled, Dalan and Emir, I'm aware uh, that grass was an integral element of your system here at Rewedog and the fact that you are enthusiastic about looking at uh, that area for future improvement by being a demonstration farm for Farming Connect. Can you explain to us briefly why it's an important element for your plans and what you hope to achieve from improving grassland here and increasing and improving efficiency by uh, improving your grassland system? Well, ultimately, the grass is the greatest asset that we have on farm, so naturally you're going to try to get the best out of it. In terms of the project then, we have been trialling different types of nitrogen to see, uh, to compare uh, protected urea uh, and urea compared with ammonium nitrate just to see what uh, what works best for us at different times of the year. The other project that we've been looking at is a, a reseed uh, using herbalase uh, to see if there's an advantage there in terms of fattening lambs. So ultimately it's trying a range of different things. Uh, throughout our lives we've uh, known reseeding here on the farm. Uh, father and grandfather always receded land and uh, we try to continue in that vein essentially uh, to continue with what they've always done here uh, but possibly uh, trying to turn uh, certain fields uh, to produce more herbalase uh, that may make it easier to fatten more lambs and do you hope then that improving efficiency in your grassland system uh, and by looking at uh, multi-species lays etc do you hope to bring down uh, your costs in terms of concentrates used for finishing lambs is that a prominent element of it for you here at Chewy Dog? well that is the ultimate goal to be honest hopefully we'll be able to spend less uh, on concentrates and uh, utilize the grass uh, to the to, to, to the greatest ability well, they do say that grass is 
the cheapest source of, of uh, food for us uh, as farmers. So Cristela is the specialist who has been working with the family here at Dog and Farming Connect on uh, this grassland project. So we'll hand you over to Chris to learn a bit more about the project. I hope you're keeping well. Uh, we've just been discussing some uh, some of the key um, objectives, really, of, of improving um, grassland here at Dog. So could you give us a bit more of an insight into the work that you've been doing here and any other relevant projects that you've been working on? Um, as well. Good evening everybody, nice to join you tonight. Um, yeah, I'm just going to take you through a couple of projects as you say, we, we started off, um, let's, let's just remind you all that uh, it wasn't many years ago that Thredo won the, the National Grassland Management Competition. So, you know, we're starting from a high baseline in terms of grassland management and I'm in now looking at projects where we can just tweak the system slightly, um, improve efficiencies, make it a little bit more robust and sustainable and able to cope with some of these extreme sort of climate events that we seem to be getting. Um, so yeah, one area that we started looking at um, this spring was um, uh, nitrogen use on the farm. Um, Alid and, and um, the gang have been using a little bit of urea in the spring um, and then primarily ammonium nitrate for silage. Um, in recent years, we've developed um, a protected year pr urea product, um, which uh, prevents the uh, ammonia loss that we often see with using urea. So urea is fine when it's wet and cold. Um, all that nitrogen in urea breaks down slowly and doesn't leach and grass growth is great. But as soon as I start seeing temperatures rise about 12 degrees and above, then I can lose 30, 40 plus percent of my nitrogen upwards as ammonia. Um, the, the real benefit of urea is it's cheaper than nitrogen as ammonium nitrate. So we're looking at about 20% saving. That's what attracts people to using urea. Um, and certainly for the Joneses when they're flat out lambing, it's nice to get fertilizer down and the urea kind of has a longer lasting effect um, than ammonium nitrate, which tends to be very soluble in the system, but maybe doesn't last quite as long. So what we looked at this year was replacing um, some of the urea with protected urea. Um, so first dressing, um, we went out, I say we, Alid went out. Um, it was April, so later than usual, if you cast your minds back, March wasn't a happy month. Um, it rained and it rained. So ground conditions kind of limited us to, to when we could get out on the fields. Um, and basically we went out with 35 kilos of the treated urea um, and then compared that with a standard urea product. Um, basically, I would have loved to have gone up and measured grass, but um, that job fell to Alid. So there he is with his tape measure. Um, measuring sward heights. So we've got the half the field that was done with protected urea, half the field that was stand, standard urea, um, and we also had a control area with um, no fertilizer applied. And using this per protected urea this spring, estimated based on Alid's pictures, um, I'm looking at somewhere around about 30% increase in growth by using those different products. So we've kept the nitrogen in the system and grown an extra six, seven hundred kilos of uh, dry matter per hectare by switching over. So the next step of the project was to extend that now to look at silage. Um, normally we'd say don't use urea once I get into warm months, um, but with a protected urea, which prevents that volatilization, we should be able to continue to use this cheaper product than ammonium nitrate right through the season. I say should, because um, we went out middle of May, um, so everything got 75 kilos um, of protected urea, which gives me about 70 units of nitrate of um, nitrogen per acre. Um, and we mirrored that with two bags of ammonium nitrate. Now, again, if you remember May, very dry. And in reality, um, we actually grew less grass with the protected urea than ammonium nitrate. Now, all the trials that have been done, an awful lot have been done over in Ireland, um, all of the trials have come back have shown that there is no yield penalty for using treated urea. Huh. The caveat to that is in the extremely dry and prolonged dry conditions this, um, through May, we think that the urea protection broke down um, because, as I say, we grew 20% less grass and it was that sustained period of maybe 15, 18 days with no rain that the prills didn't break down and... and, and, and the nitrogen was lost as ammonia. It's a project we want to 
repeat going forward and we'll have another go next year and see if we can get any different results um, but certainly it, it's an area of great interest across the world you know we've seen the horrible pictures come out of um, Beirut you know ammonium nitrate if we can get away from either the the losses involved certainly the carbon footprint and some of the issues of stability and look at other products then it makes an awful lot of sense so that's the first project we kicked off this spring um, the next one I want to talk about is um, a project looking at increasing sward quality. And I say, there's not masses we can do at Shredog. A lot of the swards are very, very good. But having said that, they've already fed five tonne of creep to lambs this spring um, to try and hit those prices that John was talking about in May, June time. Um, what would be really good is if we could get some higher quality in some of the lays just so that we can push... Um, a bunch of lambs forward and it might be 150 200 lambs that we can get away on grass rather than relying on creep um, so the field was uh, cultivated early this season I'm going to say may now allied will fill, fill us in on the dates so it's plowed dissed over um, rolled well because obviously we were struggling to keep moisture in um, I visited the farm last week um, one of the lads came careering across the field on his push bike so i know seedbed consolidation was excellent um and the lay is is up i think we've got a video clip um from today in the in the drizzle um i've got some grading cages out there so we can do some monitor some um yield production um and we're also going to have a detailed look at exactly what species have come in so as you can see those aren't weeds they're supposed to be there okay um i've got a range of different grasses um the seed mix that we've gone for is is what I would call, um, yeah, fairly wide in its in its remit. So we've got Coxfoot and Timothy, very little actually perennial ryegrass. So we're down at four percent perennial ryegrass. I've got some fescue lolium, which is a cross between a fescue um, and a ryegrass. We've got meadow fescue, I say Timothy and Coxfoot. Add into that various clovers, um, as well as sand form, which is also a legume. And all these are going to be high in protein and high in quality. So hopefully we'll be able to push animals forward in the spring. There's also some pretty stuff in there as well. Um, and we've got things like your chicory and your plantains. So it's a real mix of goodies in there. These sort of mixtures, if we look across the border in England, um, they're getting paid £300 a hectare um, on the HLS schemes to establish and maintain these lays. Um, so it's something that we might well see more in terms of where subsidy structure goes maybe they, they'll serve a, a very useful purpose on a lot of beef and sheep farms if we're going to get paid for having a massively diverse lay that also contributes to production so some of the issues really that we want to look at going forward are how the quality pans out um, what it does for animal performance can we actually get animals forward on it in in may and june and achieve growth rates 200 250 grams per day and then i guess the bigger question is will it like true um does it like bala in the wet in the cold is it going to persist because what we don't want to do these lays aren't cheap is make this huge investment and then find actually that it doesn't like the system um, we will possibly have to tweak a little bit about grazing management and try and give it a bit of a love and a hug certainly over winter um, but i think you know it'll, there'll be some interesting answers coming out of this project just to see how it behaves um, following on from that later in the summer we're going to establish another multi-species lay um, more geared towards what we know so the, the certainly the plantain and the chicories probably less complicated um, because chances are it's going to be in the silage system as well so we want something that's a little bit more robust um, but yeah we'll monitor that going forward um, while I was here, I just wanted to take you through um, another project I've been working with on multi-species lays. Um, in 2018, we established um, three lays on farms down in uh, near Bridge End as part of uh, a European, European innovation project. And we've been monitoring that performance for the last two and a half years. We're into its final year now. Um, and I just wanted to take you through, I think I've got uh, a few videos. Basically, it's the title of the project is to look at establishing it in marginal conditions because we see a lot of research focus on looking at multi-species lays on very nice fields in lovely places like Aberystwyth. Um, so I want to challenge them. So we've gone up in the world um, and really to address this question is, are they really an option for marginal areas? This morning I'm here at Geshli Fedgar Farm 
near Blackmill in the South Wales Valleys to do a, a monitoring visit on the EIP multi-species lay project. Um, so this is the multi-species lay that we sowed in June 2018. As you can see, we're fairly high up in the world. It is a tough old place to farm. Um, every month I come up here through the summer to sample the grass. Basically, we've had a grazing cage in place for the last three and a half weeks. Um, this is what we've grown under that cage. Um, and this is what I've just sampled. So I've sampled 0.1 of a square metre, um, which will get then dried, weighed, um, and we do periodic analysis for protein and energy and trace elements. The multi-species lay itself, you can see currently is fairly dominated by white clover. There is some chicory still in the plots um, and also some plantain. In terms of grasses, I've got timothy, um, perennial ryegrass, but also we've got some fescue lolium as well. We did have red clover in the beginning. There's not a heap of the red clover anymore. I think the, the sheep have predominantly grazed that out. And currently the, the chicory and the plantain are on the way out. They have done their two years. And there's, there are plants here, but not a huge number. One of the issues we've got here is the fact that we've got creeping thistle coming in. You know, I've got nothing I can spray this multi-species lay that will take the thistle out and leave all the goodies intact. So the plan is we're just going to hit these with a, a weed wiper at the end of the week um, and try and tidy them up a bit. But it is an issue. Weed control in multi-species lays um, isn't going to be easy. So Richard Morgan, who farms up here, was keen to reduce his nitrogen usage and saw the multi-species lays of a, as a good way of doing that. So throughout the project, this has had bag of DAP in the spring so that's 18 units of nitrogen 46 of phosphate and that's been it um, and certainly last year in the project we measured over 12 ton of dry matter produced from that small amount of nitrogen input as you can see the clover is very dominant and will be producing somewhere in the region of a 120 plus units of nitrogen a year Richard, this was your idea, your bright idea, this multi-species lays. Um, why were you interested in looking at multi-species lays here on the farm? Um, well, just to uh, reduce the cost and um, improve our uh, stock health, really. Um, to look at more mineral content, probably, in the lays and um, improve overall health, health on the stock. Every time I come up here, you seem to have more sheep on this field. Um, it's carried a lot of stock? Yes, yeah, carried a hell of a lot of stock especially early in the spring. It's tremendous growth in the spring and towards the back end of the year. Um, the sheep seem to graze the herbal lay before the standard lay more. So that the sheep are telling you that there's obviously a more um, palatable grass. So yeah, very pleased with the herbal lay actually. This is a fairly free draining field, but it still does muddy up in the winter. Do you get a chance to give it a break over winter? Yeah, well, we shut it off from about the end of December till uh, we start lambing about the middle of March, and then we put ewes and lambs on then, so it's rested through the winter, yeah. You had a gang of cattle up here as well, earlier on the season? Yeah, we put some, we do some wean calves, uh, buying calves to rear on from dairy herds, so um, yeah, and they were looking really tight in the spring, because we had a very dry spring. Uh, and this has made them in the summer. They actually they've grown well through the summer on this. But they've been just set stock here. We haven't rotation grazed them with the sheep. We usually mob graze on and off, but the cattle have been set stock because we were short on grass. Going forward, do you see you sowing another multi-species lay? Yeah, next year we probably after turnips um, we'll definitely put a, another herbal lay in. Yes, definitely. And now are your neighbours interested? Are they looking over the fence? Um, What's he growing all those? Well, as farmers, usually we don't say a lot. We just look, wait for a couple of years and then uh, all of a sudden you might see a lay spring up. So that, that tells you we don't say a lot, really. Grand, thanks. I'm here at Brinkworth Farm, where Phil Thomas and his family farm. Um, we're in his multi-species lay. Again, established in the summer of 2018, so now two years old. The difference with this farm is it's very much a wetter situation. Um, just over the fence you possibly see there's a field full of predominantly rushes and that's where we were in this field when it was receded there was a lot of rushes coming in and certainly the drainage wasn't wonderful um, in places so we were really putting our multi-species lay to the test after two years you can see hopefully that 
yeah, we've got a significant amount of chicory still in the sward, but a lot of the clover has gone, and certainly the plantain hasn't really survived the wetter conditions. Phil has been running cattle through here this spring, so since late April we've had a bunch of 75 cattle in here for three or four weeks on a block grazing system, and then it's had a three or four week break, they've been through again, and I think we're not far off running through another mob through here in the next week or two. This field really performed quite well in the spring. Um, I think it's been driven by the Festulolium grass, which has really responded well to the wetter conditions. Um, so Phil has been delighted with spring performance. It has tended to tail off a bit in later in the season. But I say, we had started off with the same seed mix as we had up at Gesley Fedgar, but we've got a completely different end result in terms of the species present. Uh, Chris, just a few questions coming in for you here. Um, a question from Paul Kai Hive. Uh, Chris, this year has been very challenging for spring reseeds with extremely bad chickweed and red chunk infestations. How would you recommend managing these? Um, yes, I was walking on the other day, um, very weedy. If I can avoid spraying, I will. I hate spraying reseeds. So the, the beautiful thing about a spring reseed is I've got lots of opportunities to graze it, top it, mow it, whatever whatever I can do um, physically to get on top of certainly the annual weeds like red shank, fat hen. Um, worst case scenario, yes, we can hit it with a spray. Um, and then there will possibly be opportunities to, to, to fill in the gaps. You know, we're still in August. And if there are patches certainly on areas that have burnt off um, or where the chickweed has dominated, then, you know, a good hard rate, get some bare ground and we've still got opportunity to, to stitch some more seed in. Um, I say, yeah, spray is an option, but it's, it's last on my list. If I can avoid it, I will. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, um, as Chris mentioned, we are still in the early days uh, for these projects, so keep an eye out on the Farming Connect website for more updates. Um, we will be releasing these uh, quite regularly from now on. Um, so, Chris, there are no other questions for you um, at the moment. So, thank you very much for joining us tonight and for, for giving us such a, such a detailed insight into the work that you've been doing here at Three Eight Dog. Uh, we very much appreciate um, your input tonight. So, Ermwin um, Wine, Gaboni, and to move on then, since we are a bit short on time, and as we are coming to the end of the event, in order to close this evening event, I'd like to welcome RLP Roberts. He's the development officer for this part of Medionid, who will give us just a bit more information about the Farmer Connect services and also what work is in hand currently. So over to you, Errol. Dear friends, good evening. I just want to take you quickly through the services that are available from Farming Connect. You see here the surgeries, they've been exceptionally popular during uh, the lockdown period and there's a whole range of subjects uh, that can be covered by the surgeries and you have up to an hour's discussion either over the phone or electronically with the specialist. The feedback uh, has been excellent for those who have participated in these surgeries and uh, examples, uh, legal advice, advice from an accountant, um, forestry, marketing, diversification, planning, uh, and there's a, a list of the issues covered. Then we move on to training. The application window for uh, training will be opening on the 10th of September and will be open until October 30th. And there's up to 80% available, 80% uh, subsidy on the vast majority of training courses. And the application window, as I mentioned, will open on September 7th, and you'll be able to submit your application for training. And then e-learning. These are interactive uh, learning courses. It, you can complete them at home from uh, the comfort of uh, your lounge or desk. All the information is on the Farming Connect website. You can access them from home and complete the course uh, on your computer or device and that will then be recorded on your documentation. So we have the animal health clinics. Gwaur uh, has already alluded to these. They are exceptionally popular and uh, there's uh, a fair bit of demand uh, for sampling, for testing, for taking one to one advice uh, from a local veterinarian on uh, a number of issues. 
and there is a wide range of issues that can be covered. So avail yourselves of them, they are uh, great clinics to use. So here we find ourselves uh, looking at the list of families and officers. These people are always ready to help you to provide you with the most up-to-date information on uh, any government developments. So it's a good uh, list of contacts uh, and the list there shows all the different areas and they're always ready to help in all fairness to them. And then a list of the development officers. These are the Pharma Connect uh, development officers, my working colleagues. There's a list on the website, a complete list uh, for you to be able to find your local development officer. You can see uh, who your local rep is there and the contact details are included as well in order for you to be able to swiftly get in touch with him or her. And if you require any more information, any queries that you may have, uh, you can get in touch with uh, the main office at Aberystwyth that we have the number on screen. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ariel. I'd like to take this opportunity also to encourage you as farmers and foresters to avail yourselves of the services available uh, to Farmer Connect to improve your businesses. Also, as Ariel mentioned, if you want more information about these services, you're more than welcome to get in touch with your local development officer uh, and their details are to be found on the Farmer Connect website, or you can get in touch with the head office at Aberystwyth directly. So unless there are any further questions, we are coming to the end of this event this evening. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us this evening, all uh, our contributors and uh, the family here at Zuridog for the welcome that we've received here and for the collaboration on all the projects that we uh, have been engaged with uh, as you are a demonstration farm for Farming Connect. So just a few things uh, as we close then. I'd like to remind you uh, if you could complete the evaluation form that you will receive immediately after this webinar. Uh, these feedback forms uh, effectively uh, enable us to improve uh, our services for the future, uh, that you have an opportunity to give your views uh, on uh, the webinar here this evening. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the Farming Connect website and you're more than welcome to revisit it at any time if you feel that you uh, didn't quite catch something or if you want to uh, review something. So thank you all for joining us and good evening.